Dr. Jack Turbin, Chris Mosier, and Katie Barnes still with me. I want to talk about funding, Katie, because the tiny amount of, of, of transgender athletes this is even about, yet it's taking an enormous amount of time and attention that schools and communities are working on. And most public schools out there are already struggling with underfunding. So again, while it's for a small amount of people, we often hear, well, there's this locker room issue. How do you address the locker room issue to those who say, well, trans people shouldn't necessarily be in a, in a different sex locker room, but schools don't have the money to build another locker room. How do you address these things? Well, I think part of this conversation is ultimately a distraction. You know, I think there's a concern for privacy in the locker room. And I grew up playing girls sports. I played basketball as a kid. You know, I was a perfectly serviceable point guard at the varsity level at my high school. Um, that's, that was my experience. And in the locker room, like in general, I'm in, I'm in favor of more privacy for everyone. Like I didn't like communal showers. I don't think we should have them. And I don't think that's a question about you know, whether or not transgender people should be in a locker room space. But I, what I hear, right, as I think when we ask questions about locker rooms, bathrooms, is it becomes a play on fear. There's a fear of sharing space with the unknown. Um, but in general, like there should just be stalls and private showers. And if there are not, we should have that discussion about why there are not. And I would imagine that most kids, you know, regardless of their gender, would be in favor of more privacy if they're not getting that currently. But in general, folks are in that space to do what they need to do, get dressed, go to the bathroom, take a shower, go on the field, leave, go home. Doctor, I want to broaden it out because when it comes to educating and informing kids about the questions of gender, is there a right age to introduce these ideas? Obviously, if a, if a child believes that they might be, that's different. But when you're talking about for a, a general population. Yeah, I think there are different topics that are appropriate at different developmental stages. So you're probably not going to talk about gender affirming surgeries with a 12 year old. Right, probably not particularly relevant so that those surgeries aren't done until adulthood. But really, I think the goal in these elementary school years is that we know that's a really sensitive period during which kids develop self esteem. And if a kid during that developmental period thinks, I'm the only person like this, no one is like me, all I'm hearing on the news is that people like me are wrong and outcasts in society those early messages, those can stick with a person for their life. So to be able to have just some sort of communication in elementary school that, you know, if there's a little boy who's playing with dolls and dresses to say, that's fine. Some boys like playing with dolls and dresses. Um, and just, just taking away the stigma, I think, is what's important more than anything. Chris, is there an argument to be made that it's becoming too much of a focus, right? If I was a 10-year-old girl today, and I was a tomboy like I was then, would I be asking myself, am I in the wrong body? I don't think the issue of exposure is one that we should be worried about. And, and what I mean by that is having representation and having positive role models from the trans community is not going to make someone be transgender. My presence and me being a visible out transgender athlete does not make a kid be transgender. It might just make them see themselves and see hope and possibility for themselves in this world, which is so incredibly important to the doctor's point. Like, I didn't have that when I was a kid. When I was a young person, I never pictured myself getting married, having a job or a successful career. I couldn't picture a version of myself past the age of 25. I had no hope because I didn't see any example of anybody who was like me doing what I wanted to do. And so if anything, I think representation and visibility is an incredibly powerful tool for social change and for people, all people, to see a possibility for themselves. And when we're talking about young people here, you know, more exposure to different types of people is net positive for everyone. There's no harm in any young tomboy or any young kid seeing representation of the trans community and thinking that they might be, you know, turn trans as well. Being transgender is not contagious and, and visibility and exposure does not make a young person be trans or queer or anything else. It just gives them options and hope.
Thank you so much for saying that. Doctor, we often hear on the right this, this argument that there are people out there who regret transitioning. Uh, uh, is, is that true? Is it actually happening with any real numbers? It's, it's complicated. We would, <clears throat> anytime that we talk to a family about starting a medical intervention, it is something that we talk about, this possibility that you will not want to do this treatment anymore in the future, or the possibility of regret. Most of the research we have is on the order of, you know, one to two percent of people stopping medications. Um, one thing I'll, I'll tell people to be really careful about is if you ever see a research paper talking about detransition, to, to be really careful about what that means, because if you talk to adult trans people, we published a research study, 27,000 trans adults, more than 10% of them had detransitioned at some point in the past. And most of them said it was because of stigma. People harassed them, they couldn't get a job, they were afraid of what life would be like for being trans. So you could call that detransition, but really it's kind of a forced detransition. And those people later in life transitioned again. But when we truly look at regret, the rates appear to be quite low on the order of a percent or two. I just want to remind our audience, it is a pathway. All of this takes a long period of time. It is not like your 14-year-old walking in and saying they want to get their nose pierced or want to get a mohawk and heading out and doing it the next day. It is a long process with therapists and all sorts of medical professionals helping families figure this out. Um, Chris, I want to give you the last word. Anything else you want to make sure you share with our audience? Yeah, thank you so much. It's so important that people zoom out here and really look at the issue at hand. I mean, what we're talking about has become a political issue. And my identity as a trans person is not political. It has been politicized. And these young kids across the country who just want to play sports with their friends are also being politicized and they're being the targets of harassment and discrimination from adult lawmakers who have far greater issues to take care of right now. So I encourage everyone to zoom out and look at the bigger picture here, which is this is just about kids trying to be kids and getting all of the incredible benefits that young people receive from sport. And every young person should have the opportunity to get that.